let's start with an introduction. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, Lola? Yes, uh, let's see. So I am a software engineer. Um, I work uh, at IFM. I uh, focus on robotics perception. Uh, um, I work with 3D cameras and uh, I have a background in electrical engineering. And then I um, did a PhD focusing on robotic safety. And then I took a, a long break to <laughs> work on personal projects. And uh, yeah, and now I'm here. Nice. That's very interesting. And I definitely want to start with knowing more about your PhD. Yeah, sure. Let's see. So uh, I was working on um, a specific aspect of robotic safety called active safety monitoring. So the idea is uh, to have this independent component that is only uh, responsible for safety. And we call it active because uh, we design it in such a way that it can trigger interventions if it detects that something has gone wrong. So like basic example is your robot is like going towards a wall and not breaking, right? This monitor would be able to trigger the brakes. And what I was specifically looking at is how you define kind of the rules that this monitor is going to follow and how you um, make sure that you, you know, respect your, your safety rules, but also like follow its expected behavior. Because like, of course, if you like trigger the brakes all the time, it's you're probably going to not ever going to encounter anything bad, right? But also like your robot is not going to be very useful. So we're trying to, you know, find ways to like be safe and also be able to be functional. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And it's so tricky, right? Because sometimes you do want to push the boundary just a little bit so you can be mm -hmm. able to move around and do the task that the robot is trying to do. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting because we were using some uh, modelization with graphs and, um, you know, trying to find transitions that you can remove to like a state where there is uh, some uh, something bad happening, but still allow all the, the, the useful states to still happen. And so it actually sometimes gives you ideas that you would not think of if you were just like trying to design a safety strategy, you know, out of the blue. So... So that's really interesting. Yeah, that sounds very interesting. And could you also tell our viewers uh, where you went to study your PhD? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I studied uh, at the LAS, L A A S, which is a lab in the southwest of France in Toulouse. And uh, I was in a team that focused specifically on um, safety and security, in a you know a larger sense. But um, a couple of people was were working specifically on robotics there. So, yeah. If you don't mind me asking, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what got you interested in pursuing this PhD? Yeah, that was kind of, I, I don't think that was really planned <laughs> at first, but like the, <laughs> the topic actually was really interesting. So my advisors was my professor in engineering school, and he was working on this topic before. And so he had this kind of idea and yeah, and he proposed it to a couple people and I was really interested. So yeah, that, that's how it happened. Nice. And then can you tell us a little bit about your experience pursuing PhD uh, and, you know, any challenges you faced and how you overcome them? Yeah. So I feel like, you know, in France, uh, the PhD is l somewhat limited in time. Like you're usually done before four years, which is fairly <laughs> short, right? So which which is great because you don't spend your whole life doing it <laughs> because it can be pretty intense. But um, one of the challenges then is like you... So in my case, I started this, working on this topic and I really didn't know much about it. So that like, it's a huge amount of like technologies, you know, methods, uh, scientific papers, all of the stuff that you have to kind of discover. And so it's quite a bit of knowledge to absorb in, in such a little, small amount of time. So I guess that's really one lesson, you know, like you learn to not be afraid to like dive in this really complex or like new topic, even if you haven't heard of it before. Yeah, and like, it's a really interesting experience because you, so in my case, I was working very autonomously. And so you get to develop, you know, your own rhythm and find collaborations if you want to and kind of decide what is 
kind of the track you're gonna follow. So I, and I'm guessing it's very different depending on your relationship with your advisor and you know where you work and because I know in the US uh, that it's a little bit more structures with like exams and like uh, maybe more requirements in some ways. But yeah, it's it's still you're still very autonomous in your work, which is really interesting, especially straight out of college. <laughs> Yeah, that does sound interesting. And as you mentioned, yes, in the US, I know you have to finish a certain amount of credits, like take courses, then uh, work on your research, uh, present a thesis. I think you have to present a proposal first and then mm-hmm. you defend it and so on and so forth. Yeah. Are there any similar requirements? I know you mentioned there aren't a lot, but are there any similar ones? So in in France, let's see. Uh, so you do have a requirements in the number of papers that you have. Sum- you have to submit a certain amount of paper before you can defend. So I think that's that's also a thing in the U.S. But we do not have like a sort of an intermediary exam, right? And now I'm trying to remember if we had to submit. I think you probably do have to submit sort of an abstract. Uh, before you write your dissertation and like kind of find you know the members of your jury and people have to say like yes that sounds good or (laughs) or no (laughs) but but yeah we don't have we don't have the credits and and the stuff like that which I think is actually really interesting the way they do it in the U.S. so in the U.S. it lasts way longer right you can you can be doing your PhD for seven plus years that is not rare Um, but they do have like pretty intense classes on like really advanced uh, topics, which is helpful too. Yeah, that, that, that's right. It's very common here to hear people have been doing it for a really long time. Okay, so now let's switch gear and talk about your work at IFM. Can you tell us a little bit about IFM first? Yeah, so IFM is a hardware company. So it's a German company uh, that was founded around 50-ish years ago. And uh, they develop and produce sensors, um, you know, controllers, displays, cables, things like that. Um, so they are initially they were an industrial, like focused on industrial cases, but maybe ten ish years ago they started kind of focusing a little bit more on the robotics industry and uh, industrial robotics as well specifically for perception. And so um, they developed a first uh, 3D camera that has been used quite a bit in the industry. And now we're uh, working on a new platform, which is specifically designed for mobile robotics. And maybe I can I can talk a little bit more about that in the future, but yeah. And so it's a company that has a bunch of different subsidiaries around the world. And so I work at IFM in the US and uh, yeah, the, the corporate is uh, in Germany. Nice. And then can you tell us the role of your team and yours? Yeah, totally. So uh, we, I, I'm in the robotics team, which is a pretty new team. It's been uh, created a couple, maybe a, maybe two years ago or something like that. It's, it's very fresh. <laughs> and um, so we're focusing on robotics perception and especially 3D, um, but it, it could be other things too. And let's see, so my role is uh, to support customers when they're integrating 3D cameras, either for the first time in their applications or like they're deploying in their whole, you know, robotics uh, application or uh, things like that. And I also be developing new features or if customers have a specific application that need, you know, an algorithm to do something specific, uh, I can help with that too. So I started at IFM, maybe I should have started with that, <laughs> a little bit less than a year ago. And this year has been uh, very focused on the development of this new platform, which is launching actually in a month or two. Oh, so, nice. so it's been like a kind of a, a different a different set of tasks, I would say, because since the platform is not released yet, we're still more in, in pre-development than in actual like support and deployment. Yeah, yeah, that totally makes sense. And then uh, the last question I want to ask you is, what advice would you give to those who are starting out their career in robotics? Let's see. <laughs> so I think, well, so there are two things. I think that the most important thing is to be willing to learn new things like robotics really 
gathers many, many different technologies and different concepts. At least that's my experience. Uh, so you need to be to not be afraid to like ha- get familiar with new technologies or new programming languages or tools or or whatever. This is like very common. Um, if you think between you know handling the hardware or the embedded software the mechanical aspects, the algorithms, like there's so many different things, right, in a robot. So I think being open to learning about all these things is is really important. And then you need to learn Python and C++. (laughs) I think, yeah, that's so true. Uh, You, if you want to be in robotics, even if you are going to work more on the mechanical side or some other aspect, it's definitely helpful if you know how to code. Yeah, I, I would say that's kind of unavoidable. I've been trying, <laughs> I've been like trying to avoid C++ for most of my life, but no, but you, 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 need, you need to learn it. <laughs> that's so true. And then do you have any advice for those who are going to either start PhD or thinking about pursuing a PhD? Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you know, if the topic is interesting, it's it's going to be wonderful because you have a lot of freedom. You can explore many ideas. It's a very unique experience. Um, and the other thing that is really great is like, and that I would encourage is collaborate with people if you can. Like usually during your PhD, you have the opportunity to uh, collaborate with someone abroad for a few months or like, you know, do something a little bit uh, outside of your field of research, but with super interesting researchers from a different team or stuff like that. And this is really an interesting experience. I would I would highly encourage you to do that. Yeah, that does sound interesting. But thank you so much for you know taking the time and talking about your experience with our viewers. I'm sure it'll be helpful to a lot of people. Absolutely, my pleasure. <laughs>